In 1926, a Toronto millionaire died childless. With no family foundation to prevent the slapping of pandas, he decided to do something shenanigan bequeath his fortune to the can lady Nadian, who could bear the most children in a 10-year span. A decade-long media frenzy called the Great Stork Derby kicked off, with reporters chasing preggers around the city to cover the race. People don't know why he did this. Many believed it was a joke. Others argued that it was done to shame the government into supporting contraception. But I like to imagine, for the purposes of this segue, that millionaire trollman looked at the vast, sparsely populated land of Canada and said, there is not enough people here, because then his will would have gone on to become the will of the nation. More Canadians is now a national project, long bubbling under the surface because it's obvious to anyone with these two pieces of information that Canada is underpopulated. Second largest country, 38th largest population. We regularly run into low population challenges in Canada. For example, high speed rail. It's easily viable between Montreal and Toronto or Edmonton and Calgary if the populations were twice what they are. But unfortunately, up until now, both Government officials and the kids in the back of the car have been asking the same question. Are we there yet? Better everything from rail services and sports stadiums to phone plans come with a competition and economies of scale created by population. Yeah, phone plans. Canada is swamped with monopolists, and the argument they deploy is also a low population. Canada can't support another airline, bank, cell phone, rotisserie, chicken shop. We must keep competition from destroying the industry. More Canadian customers undermines that argument. And that protectionist argument getting taken seriously is also caused by low population. It is hard to live next to a country that is nine times as populous and dominates the global economy and culture without feeling threatened. Canada's lethargic monopolists capitalize on that insecurity and successfully lobby the government to keep international competition out and allow them to absorb new competitors. We're simply too shit at what we do to face any competition. The only efficiencies you'll find in them are in their defense. But shaft citizens for sovereignty wouldn't play as well in a secure nation with a larger population, and a large population would make the domestic market more competitive regardless. And a lot of those Americans threatening us, they're Canadians. Canadians love to share critical national information about who is Canadian at the drop of a puck. James Cameron, Shania Twain, Ryan Gosling, that guy who shrunk and and then blew up his kids. Canada? Wow. But these are just the famous symptoms of a huge economic problem. Our best and brightest often have to choose between Canada and a more successful career in the United States. If we had larger and more competitive businesses and institutions, staying in Canada would become more viable for more of our high achievers, who would start their endeavors here and then in turn pave the way for other patriots who wish to stay. Finally, and related to the insecurity, comes the less tangible cultural and political problems of a low population. Whenever it's time to make a tough decision, Canadians do our research, analyze the problem, figure out a rational course of action, and then just throw that shit out the window and decide if something is too American. Political discourse and conversations here fixate on the Joneses. We're constantly stuck between cheating off the test answers and then just intentionally going the opposite direction for better and worse. When we have a difference, it gets blown out of proportion. Canada's bog standard healthcare system is elevated to the level of a grand national achievement because Americans have a worse one. It needs to be reformed, but because it's distinctly different to America, insecure nationalism makes reforms incredibly difficult. Anyone who even acknowledges market forces being something we could harness gets slammed as an American-style privatizer. Even when we're talking about strategies used in many countries with better and even more universal healthcare systems. Then there are similarities. Because Canada and America have similar cultures, histories, and geographies, we often end up with similar problems. But because Canadians spend so much time obsessed with America, we're not very good at seeing the problems that we have in common. Our electoral systems are both fucking ridiculous, the monopolies and everything from banking and telcos to sports, all our railway infrastructure being owned by private companies that don't let us use it, car culture and the way our cities are built or not. Canada would be so much better off if we just assessed things on their own merit independently. But we sleep next to the American elephant and it has made weird, insecure policies a fact of life for the entire history of the country.
Canada's position is also perilous. Recent disputes with India and China have seen our citizens murdered and imprisoned without consequence. By the way, this map of China and India really set off the nationalist map bros, but uh, what are you guys gonna do? Murder me on Canadian soil because the international community keep prioritizing their trade relationships with large countries over Canada? Oh shit! So becoming less of a moon in the diplomatic and cultural orbit of America, having big successful companies that are high achievers can stay in the country working for, by the end of the decade, let's not be a moon. These are all things that more Canadians on planet Canada can solve, which is why the government's objective is 100 million Canadians by 2100. And the trick, it's me, my friend Jeremy, Raphael, Mathilde, Berta, fresh Canadians. You can't throw a rock at a race riot without hitting a bloody immigrant these days. That's right, I come from another land down under, also with a culturally similar, much larger neighbor. So the population increasing relative to neighbor goal is very intuitive to me. Canada simply plans to reduce that gap so it's not so unbalanced, which is actually similar to what New Zealand has with Australia. New Zealand has a population of 5 million and Australia 26, a 1 to 5 ratio. The ratio between Canada and America is more like 1 to 9. If Canada was relatively New Zealand sized compared to America, it would have 66 million people. Toronto would easily be the third largest city between the two countries. And even Quebec City would pencil out for a bit of high speed rail action. Now I'm excited, even though I don't really know what the future will hold. And that number of 60 ish million people, it makes a lot of sense. Think about countries that have a strong independent identity, like France or Italy or the United Kingdom. They all have populations around 60 million. But Canada is probably going to have to push a little higher than that, not just because we have a much larger landmass. Unlike France, the US is our only neighbour. It speaks the same language and is almost the size of the whole European Union in itself. Even New Zealand is in its cultural orbit. During my last trip to New Zealand, the United States came up a lot more than Australia. Which is why 100 million gets thrown around. Wilfrid Laurier is often credited as Canada's greatest prime minister, as immortalized on the $100 banknote, which I can't afford, but I, I could afford this cheese. His government was targeting a growth rate that would have seen the country hit 100 million by the year 2000. And his cheese has a delicious creamy texture and reasonable price. Anyway, Canada would be a shadow of itself without Laurier's immigration policies, and I would be a shadow of myself without his cheese. The 100 million mark is often when people mark the arrival of the US onto the world stage. It's a round number, it's easy to remember, it's a good target. And the target is more possible in Canada than perhaps any other country for three key reasons. Geography gives us space, food and water to do that comfortably. We can sustain that population and help reduce the population burden elsewhere in the world because as far as climate change goes, Canada is getting off pretty lightly. Culturally, Canada is already an immigrant nation with a more favorable view of immigrants than most. I'm always surprised Canadians don't tell me to go home for my near constant complaining about their country. Hey buddy, if you want the makeup of your government to reflect the will of the people, why don't you get back to New Zealand, mate? There's an identity around being pro-diversity and immigration here that people really took to heart. Finally are Canada's systems for success and integration. The immigration system skims for skilled immigrants who commit less crime, end up in decent jobs, and integrate more quickly. The education system gives their children an affordable, high-quality education. The healthcare system, as bad as it is, doesn't burden them if a family member gets sick. Canada subsequently has generational wealth mobility that is amongst the highest in the world. Lots of countries have one of these elements. America is similar to Canada when it comes to a diversity culture, but it's totally let down by its systems. Europe has great systems, but in many places, not the pro-immigrant culture or the geography to house and feed. Canada has all three, a large geography, pro-immigrant culture, and solid systems for success and integration. So the reasoning was solid and the soil fertile, but this is where trends and forces got a boost from some particularly driven and influential individuals. First of all, you have the Century Initiative, a think tank geared to lobby and support this goal. And then this very persuasive book called Maximum Canada by Doug Saunders. These worked in tandem, one to provide the technocratic evidence and the other to promote it. In 2000, Canada was the 140th fastest growing country in the world. The population was just over 30 million with an annual growth rate of 0.93%, adding 284,000 people that year. It put Canada behind America and Australia, 
just ahead of France and the United Kingdom, but far behind countries like India and the Philippines. In the mid-2010s, high growth became official government policy. Starting in 2016, things started to ramp up, hitting 1.1, 1.2, 1.4%, then roaring back after the pandemic. In 2023, the population growth hit 2.9%, blowing past 40 million, rapidly dating the cover of this book in just six years. And somewhat tellingly, the new editions of it actually don't have a number. Canada has moved up from 140th to the 54th fastest growing country, jumping past America and Australia, but surprisingly also India and the Philippines. It makes for a pretty funny list. You have just this one highly developed Western democracy hanging out there with countries that don't pull out or the stops when it comes to family planning. But I think it's fair to say the booster rockets are now falling off the Planet Canada project because maintaining a national project is hard in a country with no single national government and to be honest, a pretty incompetent national government at that. Even if the federal government's bureaucracy does slow things down, the real bottlenecks are at other levels. Starting at the very bottom are municipalities, where the fire hose of immigrants has hastened the housing crisis from god-awful to a now multi-generation defining disaster. Canada is currently on track to be 3.5 million homes short in the next decade, and the evidence is now in every park, in every city and town across the nation. The housing shortage really makes Canada feel like it's falling apart because it's looking shabby and feeling desperate. If you're a low-income renter like me and the closest you get to a laurier in your pocket is some cheese that's on sale, you really feel the poverty nipping at your heels. Childcare is difficult. Getting a doctor is fucking impossible. Everything is getting expensive. Why? Is this part of the plan? The Century Initiative was created by global consulting elites at McKinsey, and it does have mixed Google reviews at a location that I went to to film, which is not where they are actually based. An error on Google Maps or a false flag? Canada is broken is something that you hear a lot these days, and yeah, it is. Good, we're all finally on the same page. Newsflash, Canada. Canada was broken. It just wasn't fucking broken enough for enough middle class people to care. Vancouver's nimbyism created the open air mental hospital of East Hastings for decades. A perpetual level of human suffering created by unserious, timid policies that did not work. Excruciating debates on every fucking housing project. If we block the views of the mountains and off the water, Vancouver looks just like Saskatoon. Ah yes, that's what would ruin the park. Research shows that we understand supply's effect on durable goods and commodities and labor, but on housing just refuse to accept the fact that low supply is causing this crisis, because that would mean losing a view or having a construction site next door, or worse yet, poor people. The suffering created by Vancouver's nimbyism has been astounding. But that framework of policies, supply strangling suburbs and land reserves wasn't just Vancouver's recipe for disaster, it was a national dish. Housing prices skyrocketed following the financial crisis in 2009. Well before mass immigration, we were headed straight towards this iceberg. Vancouver was just a visible bellwether for how bad our whole system is at building housing. And the immigration wave hit, and those inadequate policies East Hastingsified the whole country in just a couple of years. And finally, something has happened. Canada's doing something. The other cities and provinces did a speed run of Vancouver's small change policies like secondary suites and then within the space of the last year have been making the really significant actual changes that are a recipe for national success. End exclusionary zoning and build affordable homes where people want to live. Yes to building more homes in Canada's backyard. Toronto City Council has voted to overhaul residential zoning bylaws that advocates say have restricted the city's growth for generations. I'm actually studying the option of allowing up to six units in my ward. Which would change zoning in most neighborhoods to allow for buildings up to three stories. The plan announced on Monday will allow up to four units on traditional single family lots. It has been read a third time and has passed. Absolutely game changing. Nominee contra descende. 
All those in favor say aye. The federal government also got the shit scared out of it from the outrage caused by their immigration right hand not knowing what the housing left hand was doing. In other words, far more people, far less home building. And started pumping funds to bribe cities and provinces into getting shit built fast. For people who have been fighting for this stuff well before 2016, the bad policy bonfire is almost hard to believe. It's happening. It's finally happening. I did a video about how this was likely to happen at the start of 2023. At some point, a random pile of dictated policies will be coming to your town. But I never would have guessed that we would be rounding up year with this much progress. And there's plenty more to come. The policies are rolling out every week. Just yesterday, the feds announced an open design spec for ready to build housing similar to the veterans housing, which was rolled out during the housing crisis that followed World War II. I'm sure that by the time you see this video, there'll be even more. Canadians have been stuck paying way more than they should have for less options most of the last century. If we had just kept with the low growth rate of the past, we might have stuck with the status quo and the low level misery of undersupply of housing for generations. Now, whenever we do take our foot off the immigration accelerator, housing will return to normal and we're gonna get lots of cities with large walkable neighborhoods surrounding their downtowns and transit. Interestingly enough, helping to further differentiate our cities from ones in America. So we're gonna get this unplanned source of national pride and identity coming into boot. Other places where the demand is exposing bad systems provide similar examples. Take healthcare. I came to Canada in 2009 and I couldn't get a family doctor until 2016. All of this is before immigration started to rise. This is not a good healthcare system. That was not a good healthcare system either. It's the same broken system. Being better than America on healthcare is like being better on gun control than America. It's not an achievement. We are now finally facing the fact that we have a problem because for many middle-class Canadians on healthcare, they actually would be better off in America. We have no choice now but to break with the broken status quo and try something new because this is not working. But how much growing pain can we actually endure? Because Canadians who didn't believe supply was a problem over the last decade seem to have no problem believing demand is now. The pain is real and they're not wrong to identify why it's suddenly getting worse. We cannot afford that because we cannot integrate them in our society. Yeah. It's just adding fuel to the fire when it comes to the housing crisis. That's why housing is so expensive. Unlike blaming drugs or mental illness or investors, cutting immigration would significantly reduce housing costs and homelessness. If Canada's population was decreasing, housing would become really cheap. Homeless people would move out of parks and into vacant housing and squats, just like the old days. On Second Canada subreddit and Second Canadian Housing subreddit and Second Canadian Personal Finance subreddit, the demand comprehenders post everything from tales of sleeping in cars and harrowing human misery to posts screaming the quiet part out loud with massive support, which is something I don't remember seeing in Canada prior to now, even in CBC comments. Racists don't need an excuse to be racist, so when they actually have one, like they're not being enough housing or doctors, you're gonna hear about it. And the polls are confirming it, so it's just a matter of time for the politicians, right? Well, this is where an interesting thing's happening. One of the dirty truths of human civilization is that without the private sector, we probably wouldn't overcome our natural xenophobia enough to have much immigration. Businesses have always been the biggest backers of immigration. Immigrants provide both cheap labor and more customers. Canada has these large oligopolies that have been pushing immigration for decades. For the whales like CN, RBC and Rogers, a million new immigrants are more captive plankton in the sea, which will pretty much automatically get added to their share price. The strategy of the opposition is to criticize the current government for failing on housing supply, central bank policy, spending carbon taxes, but very obviously avoid touching the third rail of immigration. They're polling very well and probably will win the next election without needing to pull out the Trump card and blame immigrants. Drugs, criminals, gang members, and terrorists are pouring into our country at record levels. We've never seen anything like it. They're taking over our cities. 
It has got mixed feelings as regards the Irish. So there is a bipartisan consensus on immigration from the two main parties, for now, but it's not going to last forever. Maintaining the rate long enough to see our planet in orbit is going to mean fixing these problems faster than our government usually can. And it's going to mean seeing immigrants as more than grist for the Rogers mill, because immigrants can fix the underlying problems they have helped expose. A large motivation for immigrants is our healthcare system. And although I've talked more about the kind of grand vision, a lot of this was initially done to simply relieve pressure on our patchy population pyramid. Top heavy with baby boomers and a pretty bleak future if something wasn't done. Our healthcare system needs them. I mean, a friend of mine is being trained right now in at-home care, and he is literally the only person in his class who isn't a recent immigrant. And I don't think Canada's seniors would be any better off if the only person left to wipe ass was one white white dude from Brampton. But our healthcare system still manages to waste them because our provinces won't fucking certify new arrivals. Only 36.5% of immigrants trained abroad in registered nursing are working in that field. Only 41.1% with foreign medical degrees are working as physicians. The proverbial taxi driving doctor has become the Uber driving doctor as we waste years of productivity making them redo schooling for things they already know. Because of a cost of living, many of them are unable to put their life on hold and get that done. So at current levels of immigration, hopefully you don't have to wipe grandma's asshole. But if we were actually getting people working in their fields, grandma could get a whole new asshole. Maybe you could also have healthcare. Wouldn't that be nice? We're also funneling them into these diploma mills instead of training them for what we need. We need skilled workers, and building housing is a much better use of labor than a certificate of participation to land a job at Timmy's. Because as the available land is ramping up, we're gonna hit the other obvious shortages in construction workers almost immediately. The federal government has begun to twiddle the knobs and prioritize immigrants that can work in these fields. But in both housing and healthcare, immigrants have to get certified by a province. Immigrants are also often unable to relocate for work where they are needed. They're much less likely to have the additional certifications that allow them to work across provincial borders. The federal government needs to smarten up and look at immigration as a solution for only the things we need, not want. We need housing and nurses. We want Uber Eats and two-day Amazon delivery. The feds have to get provinces to certify immigrants in these critical fields as if their electoral chances depend on it, because they fucking do. By setting up paths to residency for building houses and working in healthcare, these new Canadians will be happier as well. It feels good to be needed, and a lot of these jobs are better ways to integrate into Canadian life than driving around dropping off burritos on people's doorsteps. This has also exposed yet another long-neglected issue in Canada with interprovincial certification. Like housing, the feds also should harness the situation to get all provinces into a trade agreement like the New West Partnership Agreement, so that people and goods can easily flow between provinces, finally. If you want proof that stuff in Canada stays broken for way too long, that has been going on for 156 years. These changes are underway, but it's always reactive and a little too late. It's a race against time to patch the rocket while the consensus holds. Because we've been here before. Canada ended up fumbling Laurier's grand plans. The goal of 100 million Canadians by the year 2000 was cut short a mere decade into the century. That immigration wave can be seen in the Ukrainian and Polish names of many Canadians today. But unlike last time, we won't get another shot at right-sizing our population to our geography. Remember the Philippines and India? Part of the reason Canada passed them in population growth is because their population growth has slowed. It is puttering out worldwide, much faster than anticipated. We will rapidly lose countries to choose from in selecting immigrants over the next few decades. This century, we are locking in our permanent size, and other countries are realizing this and deploying similar strategies. Australia just clocked growth at around 2%. The cost of living problems are bad enough for making immigrants reconsider Canada. Canada can't simply choose the old status quo and still give our seniors the retirement that they deserve. We also can't roll things back and stay an important force in the world. We love being at the big kids table of G7. 
But we're only there because of a technicality. We're America's plus one. We're actually the ninth largest economy, and over the next century, without population growth, we're not going to stay in G7, and we'll be lucky to stay in G20. The next decade in Canada is a national test, where we can only achieve this greatness through goodness. Human nature is to resist immigration and not see the win-win that we can have in this country. Australia is already stumbling. America is projecting population decline for the first time. If Canada has what it takes to become a confident world power, we need to hold tight to those values of tolerance and civility, which have already enabled far more immigration than most countries could handle. Canadian exceptionalism exists. It is the ability of this country to take people from around the world and turn them into Canadians. But to keep going, we need governance that can get to work on the lingering problems that immigration has simply exposed. I have a lot of faith in Canadian civility. It is an amazing superpower for a nation at a moment like this in its history. But even Canadians will stop holding open the door if they don't have a house. This is crazy. This property is tiny. Do any of you have any idea how frightening it is to be woken up in the middle of the night and evacuated from your home? It appears the majority of the units won't have parking. And if there's cars parked on both sides, it's going to be a disaster. I don't know where this is being made up of in there. This looks like they're trying to put a children's playground in the middle of a dodgeball court. I'm all for dodgeball, and I'm all for children in playgrounds, but Put them together, and this is crazy. We enjoy to hang out, such as scootering and biking. With this new building, we will be able to do this because there will be cars and big trucks parked on both sides of the street. Ask the mailman. They are clueless. This process is not for you and me. Let's make this process for you and me. And I'm assuming you're done. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, next, we have Marie Gordon. 